Okay, it's the top of the hour, so we'll get started right on time. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I am calling this meeting uh, the March 2024 monthly meeting of the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission to order. Thank you all for being here. Uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully everybody's seeing my copy of the agenda and not too much else. Great. Um, as always, uh, we will begin the meeting um, with roll call introductions and the equity and land acknowledgement. We're actually going to do the land acknowledgement first. And can someone who can see that please give this a read for me, please? Do we have any volunteers? And I'll jump at once. I can go ahead and read it, Brian. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Whenever you're ready for me. Uh, yep. Yeah, go. <clears throat> We as the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission want to begin this meeting by affirming BPAC's commitment to equity and racial justice. We would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on lands that have served as the home for diverse indigenous communities long before current governments were established here. We pay our respect to the elders and members of these communities, both past and present, and recognize the harms of genocide and colonialism. We will make a conscious effort to reflect on the following questions as we advance through our business and contemplate changes in our community. And we recognize that achieving equity requires our commitment to an ongoing process. How can we seek to repair harm with our work and not erase history? How does our work impact the vulnerability and safety of people who hold many intersecting marginalized identities, including black, indigenous, and people of color, people with disabilities, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning people? How can we prioritize and center people in our decision-making? How can we be more responsive to local needs? How can our work build community power and shared decision-making? Thank you very much, Andres. Okay. Uh, Next up, I will stop sharing for a moment, because next up is introductions. I will we'll call on people going around the screen as I see you, um, starting with myself. I'm Brian Hawkins. I am the chair of the Durham Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission, and I also uh, sit on the uh, Development Review Committee. Uh, going now to Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Lee. I um, am the Duke liaison for BPAC, and I normally sit on Pi and will be taking over Pi from Mike as the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I see Ed Rizzuto. Ed, would you like to introduce yourself? We have you on mute. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Rizzuto. I sit on the Triple E committee. Thank you very much. Uh, one of our guests, Pastor Harley, would you like to introduce yourself? Afraid we're not getting your audio, sir. Not sure why. Uh, sorry, we're not hearing you. If you want to just introduce yourself in the chat, or we can come back to you, and I'll I'll come back around. Um, Hannah Salvaggio. Hi there, I'm Hannah Salvaggio, Bike and Pedestrian Planner and Staff Liaison for this commission. Perfect. 
Ideal. Hey, y'all. My name's Ideal Ortiz, and I sit on the Triple E subcommittee. Thank you, Marissa. Hi, good evening, Marissa Hartzler. I am the vice chair and also sit on Deborah. Thank you very much, Andres. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andres Otero. I'm the county youth representative, and I sit on the Triple E committee. Thank you, Scott. Yes, I'm hi, Scott Carter, um, chair of DevRev. Thank you, sir. Mike. Yes, uh, Mike Shepard. I am the secretary for BPAC. I've been working as the chair and pie. Very happy to hear Nathan's going to take that on. I could do a great job and happy to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. Royal. Good evening, everyone. I'm Royal, representing North Carolina Central University and the Fayetteville Street Corridor. Thank you very much. Carl Rist. Good evening, everyone. Carl Rist. I'm the Durham City Council representative to BPAC. Glad to be here. Glad to have you, Mary Rose. Hi, I'm Mary Rose Fontana. I am the County Bicycle Community Representative, and I'm regularly on PI. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Hi, Jeff Bukalchuk. I am um, liaison to the uh, Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. Um, I was trying to be on um, DevRev, but the schedule just doesn't, doesn't work for me, so I'm kind of looking for another committee to uh, to join. Understood. Uh, let's see, uh, I believe another guest, uh, Donna Edwards, would you like to introduce yourself? It is not our night for guests and audio, I'm afraid. We'll we'll come back around. Uh, holler, Donna, if you find uh, find something different audio wise. Um, Dale McKeel uh, has introduced yourself in the chat. Uh, let's see. As has David Braidway. Uh, uh, Suzanne Schmall. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Suzanne Schmall, previous BPAC chair, previous Triple E chair, and still sitting on Triple E. Thank you very much. Uh, another guest, and I should remember this from last time, is it Robin Young? <laughs> yes, it's ah, Robin right. Young. It. Very Thank good. You. One of these days, I'll figure out how to update my name on Zoom. Um, City of Durham, transportation engineer. Great, thank you for being here. Uh, Lauren Grove. Yeah, hi folks. Lauren Grove, Vision Zero Coordinator with the City of Durham. I'm gonna be presenting later at today's meeting. Fantastic, we're looking forward to that. Brian Taylor. Hello, Brian Taylor, Transportation Planner for the City of Durham and liaison to the BPAC PI Committee. Thank you. Aspen. Hey, sorry, I have odd voice in background. Um, I'm Aspen. I am a uh, just an advocate and interested in um, watching these feedback meetings, so I often just join as a guest. Thanks. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, Heidi Carter. Evening, everyone. I'm Heidi Carter. I'm the County Commissioner Liaison to BBAC. Thank you very much. Uh, Pastor Harley's introduced himself in the chat. He's the CEO of Second Chance Outreach Equipping Center, and I'm told he can hear us, which is great. Uh, Donna Edwards is on the board of Second Chance Outreach Equipping Center. So thank you both for being here. Did I miss anybody in this round of intros? Sometimes the Squares jump around as people come in. So I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Okay, great. Uh, Hannah, excused absences. I have one. Do you have any? I don't have any. Uh, Landon told me ahead of time he wasn't going to be able to make it. So, and do we have any updates on our vacancies? 
Yes. So um, for the city transportation planning policy position that was open, that has now been closed. Um, there were a couple of applicants for that and it's going for the April 4th work sessions to city council. Um, we still have the youth representative position open. That's on the city side. Um, we do not have any applicants for that yet. Um, and that deadline is March 27th. Um, and then on the county side, we are um, we have two positions still open, the at large, and then also the senior advocacy. Both of those have not received any applicants and or applications, and those are open until March 31st. Um, and the both um, city and county clerk's office, they asked that the boards um, and commissions could really help do some promotions on um, these openings because um, they, they can't really do a ton. Um, so if anyone on this commission can really spread the word about it, I think um, at least the youth representative, the at-large and senior advocacy, those ones um, definitely need to help people about and hopefully get someone to apply to those. Hannah, can you remind me again which ones come into the city? That is the transportation planning policy. There were two applicants. And that's going to come to us but in the next council meeting? I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah she said it was the April 4th work session. Okay. And does, does BPEC ever like advise on other, if we have choices, like who you all think we should choose? And, and is that maybe in the packet we have? or So in the past, um, normally it's actually been on the county side that they will um, send some of the applicants to me to kind of look at and review. Um, but typically they don't really push it to us at all. Um, but you all, like the city council and the board of commissioners, I believe you all see the applications and the resume and everything like that um, in advance. So if there ever is any questions um, or would like some suggestions or anything like that, feel free to pass yeah. it. To Brian, us. I'll reach out to you about that once I see that material. Hey. So that's two applicants for the city planning position, zero for youth, which is a city, and zero for the two county positions, which are an at-large and senior advocacy. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, certainly, if we can push that on social, the social media we have, but also everybody, if you can activate your own networks. I'm pretty sure one of the people applying for the city planning one is somebody I harassed into applying. So. Um, Maybe we can get both of those people in somehow. That would be great. Um, maybe they can also apply for the county position. So, um, Donna, Pastor Harley, I'm seeing your comments in the chat. We'll get to you in public comment in just a minute, and hopefully we can figure out something technically so we can hear from you. Um, does anybody have any uh, adjustments to the agenda to make? Hopefully everybody's had a chance to look at the agenda. Okay, great. Hearing none there, uh, we're going to move right on to approving the minutes from the February meetings. I say meetings plural because we extended our February meeting to get together a letter for the budget. Thank you to everybody who put in the extra time on that so we could turn that around quickly. Um, the minutes of both of those meetings were combined into the minutes documents that we sent around and hopefully everybody's had a chance to review. Does anybody have any Additions or subtractions to make to those minutes. If not, could I please get a motion to approve them? I, I so motion. That was Nathan. I'll second it. That was Jeff. All in favor of uh, approving the minutes for the February meetings as written, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay, uh, we're into the public comment period. Um, let's see if we can do an audio check with either uh, Pastor Harley or Donna. Can you, can we hear you? 
Um, Brian, we can't hear them, but we have a message from uh, Donna and Pastor Harley in the chat, if you'd like me to read that out loud for everyone. Yeah, if you would go ahead and read that, that'd be great. I did see it, but let's uh, read it into the record. Yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, Pastor Harley would like to know if BPAC would be willing to donate some bicycles to use. They're having a community event on Saturday, May 11th, 2024, uh, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Greater Refuge Temple uh, on 1438 Maplewood Drive here in Durham. And so we can um, have that as part of the public comment section, but we wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that comment. Thank you very much. Um, so to my knowledge, BPAC doesn't have ourselves as an organization bicycles to donate, but with that amount of time, we can probably put you in touch with somebody who does. Um, first group coming to my mind being the bike co-op. Does anybody else have anything <coughs> to Excuse throw me. in there? Yeah, I was going to suggest the bike co-op, but I also wanted to clarify some, or like have some questions to clarify on. So would these be bicycles for adults to use or children to use or a combination of both? Um, and are they just for the duration of the event or are they for people to keep afterward? Those are good questions. I'll um, maybe give our guests a minute to respond since I think we're having to type. <laughs> kids, bikes for kids. And is it to keep or for the event? To keep for themselves. Okay. What is um, the overall community event called and the overall purpose of the event? And also, how many bikes are we thinking? Maybe we can follow up with Donna after this. Um, it's probably a good idea. Yeah, she had said that there she had issues before this meeting. Um, typically, being able to talk at during Zoom meetings. So, okay. Um. <clears throat> restoration. Okay, the event is called the God of Second Chance Restoration Service for Unity in the Community. We also partner with CEF. Just an acronym I'm afraid I don't know. CEF is Community Empowerment Fund. They're an organization that's in, uh, Durham, in Durham and Chapel Hill. If I'm thinking of the right CEF, if I'm not, someone please correct me. Okay, great. Um, why don't I suggest we possibly take that up for discussion in the Tripoli Committee? And... Um, maybe see about getting them in touch with the co-op. And yeah, Ideal just said, uh, Donna, if you could share your contact info so we could follow up with you. Thank you for that. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. I also have problems with Zoom sometimes. I wish I could help. Uh, do we have anybody else uh, wishing to make public comment this evening? Yay. Hearing none, I think we can move on to uh, our other guest, uh, Lauren. Yeah, you want me to go ahead and share my screen and yes, take it away? Please. Okay. All righty, everybody can see that. Hey, um, 
So thanks for having me today, everyone. I wanted to um, provide an update on where we're at with Vision Zero, where we're headed, um, and really kind of use this as a way for me to get a pulse on some of the outline for the next year. I believe the last time I presented, I may have mentioned um, that our goal is to have an action plan developed at the end of the calendar year, 2024. That is still the goal. So I would like to make this an iterative process of coming to this commission and many other groups to walk through the process for getting to an action plan by the end of the year. Um, so with that, I wanna start with a thank you um, to folks here and many others who have advocated for Vision Zero um, commitments, resources that have created this Vision Zero coordinator position that I am now in, but uh, who continue to advocate for safer streets. Y'all are incredible and I appreciate everybody showing up to meetings, including last night's budget meeting, to, to continue to voice um, the needs and desires of the community for safer streets. So thank you. We would not be able to do this work without you. So over the next 15 or so minutes, I wanna talk about what is Vision Zero, which I'm sure this group is very well aware of, but it's always good to be on the same page. Um, what are the current conditions? So we'll look at some crash data and other data. What have we achieved so far? This will be kind of a snapshot of some Vision Zero aligned um, built environment components that we've been able to implement. And then where are we headed? I'm gonna start with a question though. I'm hoping folks might be able to engage with me on this. So on the screen are some numbers and I, I'm curious if anybody has a guess as to what these numbers might represent. Traffic deaths. Yeah, they are actually ages of people in Durham who have died or been seriously injured in traffic crashes in the last five years. Um, duplicates were removed. So for example, there were three one-year-olds who died in crashes in Durham. This is a reminder to all of us why we are here, why we are advocating for milestones like zero traffic deaths and serious injuries um, so that one day we will not have a slide with any ages at all. So Vision Zero is a strategy to eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries and improve street safety for all road users. Um, what I find to be integral to Vision Zero is that it's rooted in really strong policy and standards. So these policies recognize that um, these are not accidents. People are not dying by accident. They are preventable and unacceptable. We really focus on looking at data to identify leading causes of injury and target those causes, as well as invest in underrepresented communities and measures that uh, positively impact those who are disproportionately experiencing traffic violence. I think a big component of all of this, though, is policy that prioritizes safety over other transportation objectives like congestion. Um, this can unfold in a lot of ways. I think cities that are successful with this implement some sort of level of service that is multimodal. And that's one way that we really, um, really start to see in policy how Vision Zero can be integrated into our transportation systems. Um, I presented this, I think, at a meeting the first time I was here, 
I think it's really important to make sure, though, that this is the framework that we're building Vision Zero on, which is safe systems. So this is a, a pyramid that frames safe systems. Some folks may be familiar with that term or familiar with a different visual representation of safe systems. Um, this is a, a newer model. It's actually born out of public health frameworks that looks at the hierarchy of controls. So the hierarchy of controls was created to prevent injuries in the workplace. And this is no different. We are preventing injury in our transportation system. And so that framework, that hierarchy of controls uh, addresses the, the root cause of injury. It recognizes that the human body can only sustain so much force before it's injured. And so we're gonna uh, implement policies and measures to make sure that that force is decreased or in, uh, eliminated entirely so that nobody is injured or dies. So where we wanna focus our Vision Zero strategy are in numbers one and two, so socioeconomic factors. We can think about this as our transportation policy. Um, some of the things that come to mind for me <clears throat> are developing street design standards that really um, integrate all of the safe streets design elements that we know make it safer for all road users. And so thinking about how that as a policy impacts everybody, right? It's at the population level. It doesn't rely on anybody to um, operate perfectly or, or safely all the time in our transportation system. If we are standardizing the way that we design streets, if we are standardizing our land use policies such that people can more safely access transit, for example, um, this is something that impacts at the population level. Uh, when you go up the pyramid to built environment, these are things like narrower uh, roadways, narrow travel lanes, physical separation between different road users that are also key to decreasing the amount of force or the amount of impact that happens in a crash. So this model recognizes that, that people make mistakes, crashes will happen, nobody has to die uh, when that happens. And so that becomes more impactful at the population scale when you really root your measures and resources in numbers one and two. Um, as you go up uh, this pyramid, you see things like latent safety measures. These are gonna be um, things like signal timing or leading pedestrian intervals. So they're built into the system. They don't rely as much on humans for it to be impactful. Um, they're just kind of already there. Um, and then number four, active measures. These are gonna be things like stop signs, typical um, sort of components like that, that actually rely on the individual to make the effort to stop at the stop sign. Um, this also implies that, you know, to be effective, they would have to be citywide or they'd have to be strategically placed everywhere. And so it really starts to rely more on um, hoping that people abide by those signs than anything else. And then finally, number five, education. So this would be something like a drive safe campaign or, you know, slow down. Um, sort of any sort of education campaign that, again, really relies on individuals to follow the campaign. The campaign has to be accessible to everybody. It has to be uh, consistent and long-term. And we know that that is way less reliable for encouraging and enforcing slower speeds and, and safer environments than say, actually designing and building safe streets. It's not to say that we don't want to do those things. It needs to be a layered approach, much like the pyramid is representing. Um, so we have to have all of these working together. And, you know, we really want to focus on the measures that that impact entire populations rather than hoping that people um, are safe all the time on our roadways. 
So an example of what this looks like, um, there's a lot of really great examples across the US and globally of implementing safe systems. It's not, um, you could probably look at a lot of cities action plans and, and see it there. But I think this example in Alexandria is a really good one. They committed to Vision Zero in 2017, same time as Durham. And they focused on a safe systems approach that really targeted built environment and policy changes at scale. So they looked citywide. They did focus on high crash corridors and managing speeds on those corridors. And they also said citywide, we need slower speeds. So they lowered residential speeds regardless of crash history. Um, they added bicycle facilities, sidewalks, upgraded crosswalks, treated intersections like signal timing. These are not hugely like transformative on their face, right? But they are done all together. They are done strategically, citywide, not necessarily a one-off. It's very methodical. So I think with that, they were able to address the series of people dying since about 2018. There are about five people every year that died in traffic crashes in Alexandria. And in 2023, they achieved a milestone where they had zero traffic deaths, still had serious injuries. And I just really appreciate the way that they um, framed this with media and with their outreach, acknowledging and celebrating that nobody died and acknowledging that there's more work to be done because there were still serious injuries. So I think this is a great example um, of how the, the tools, we, we know what the tools are and it's how we implement them and apply them that I think uh, lends itself to improved uh, street safety. So what are the current conditions in Durham? This is a snapshot of about the last 11 years since 2013 of traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Serious injuries are the orange bars that are taller on this bar graph. Fatalities are the darker blue there. Um, you can see that we are trending in the wrong direction as noted by those dotted trend lines. Um, I mean, this is, when you look at traffic data and traffic deaths in different cities, there is in, especially in the US, there is this up and down pattern over the years. Um, and to me, that just signals, there's no significant decrease or trend downward. Um, and we're not consistently applying safety countermeasures to trend downward, right? So we're doing some stuff, we need to be more strategic with how we are doing it. And you'll note in the last, <clears throat> five years since 2019, we've seen a really stark increase in serious injuries and fatalities. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here. Okay, so this is just fatal crashes in the last five years since 2019. I think one note personally, it's interesting that pedestrian and bicyclist are a crash type. Um, I, if it were me, I would parse that out because that's they're not causing the crash. Um, they're not causing themselves to die in a crash, right? It's the injury. It's that force that we talked about. Anyway, this is the data as it is. So the top three crash types account for nearly 50% of fatalities, pedestrian involved crashes being the highest with almost 19%. Angle crashes, which we know are correctable, are about 18%, represent 18% of fatalities. And then drivers running off the road, particularly running off the road to the right, <laughs> represent 12% of fatal crashes. All of these to me say that there is a speeding problem. There are built environment solutions that we could likely implement to correct and prevent uh, these from being fatalities. A little bit about location. So a lot of the data that I'm sharing, this is like kind of just the first brush stroke of putting together elements for an action plan of figuring out what are the patterns. There's so much more to be done here. So 
I'm hoping, as I mentioned at the beginning, this will be iterative. I'll be coming back to share more updates as, as it develops. From what we can see here of 2019 to 2023 data, there were 121 fatalities that are shown on the map here. So that's another thing to note. Not all of this um, data is mapped. There's a few locations that just are not obtainable from the crash report. So um, this is just showing the mapped data for fatalities and serious injuries. There were 266 serious injuries. If we look at um, the street type, 80% of the fatalities are occurring on surface streets. And what I mean by that is um, they are not on an elevated typical interstate, like 85, 885, 40. Um, I did include 147 uh, in that too, but we know there are part portions of 147, portions of 70 that actually are at the surface level, right? They're not elevated. They could be accessible by a person walking, for example, if they really needed to get somewhere, right? And so we don't necessarily want to exclude those roadways in this analysis because of that. I also know that there are some surface streets that are US routes or NC routes that have businesses along them, sidewalks and traffic signals and all of these elements that we would consider um, that are part of that invite a lot of more conflict and invite more activity. So we wanna think about those roadway types when we're doing an analysis like this because we as a city have maybe slightly more interest in that type of roadway, whereas the interstates, those really are in um, the state's domain and, and we might wanna be um, extra, extra collaborative on any sort of um, improvements to the that type of corridor. And then finally, um, on this slide are a few different, um, demographic data. So in blue are block groups where households um, with greater are block groups that households with people of color, 65.4% of those are black groups have um, households of people of color. And then the pink are census tracts. Um, those are the HUD low income qualified census tracts, and then when you overlay those, you get the purple color there. And so the purple is both. And when you look at the fatal um, crashes that are happening in that area, they are happening with more frequency. 30% of fatalities are happening in those communities compared to 16% of all crashes. So we're seeing a disproportionate number of fatal crashes happening in, in these communities. So I wanna clarify that it's happening in these communities and not two. That would be a next step is to look at who are involved in, in, a, um, in these severe crashes. So what have we done so far since 2017? I'm still learning this as I'm three and a half months in, but from what I can tell, there's a lot happening that's aligned with Vision Zero. This is a snapshot, so this does not include, I'm certainly missing things here, but from a high level, there's already a Vision Zero resolution. We have an opportunity to really, um, integrate Vision Zero with the UDO update that's currently happening. I think that's a crucial one that we all need to be paying attention to and giving comment on. We have uh, plans that are being updated, like our bike walk plan, an opportunity there. Um, Move Durham has identified a series of corridors that I know are unsafe on a number of levels through community concern and data that you know is a jumping off point for talking about what we address first. And a number of other programs, projects, and coordination that I think really lend itself to a successful Vision Zero plan and why I feel really confident that we could have a really strong set of action items by the end of this year specifically noting the coordination with NCDOT. We have monthly meetings with them. 
um, to discuss locations and what we might be able to do to make improvements at uh, locations with high number of crashes. So there's a lot of really good work already happening here and this plan is going to build on the good work and then identify missing gaps um, from that. A few of the um, components that I wanted to call out specifically, kind of going back to that pyramid where we're talking about built environment. This is what we mean. This is some of what me, we mean. So on the left um, is an example of a safer crossing with a pedestrian activated signal that you can see on the right where you push it and it lights up, a high visibility crosswalk, and a pedestrian refuge island. So some con concrete infrastructure that allows for people walking across one lane at a time. This is a safe crossing. Uh, on the right is an example of some traffic calming that was done in the south side area um, that took a lot of collaboration. And I really want to applaud what I learned about this project and the collaboration that happened, especially with the fire department actually bringing out their fire apparatuses to test the speed cushions and test this out. I think that's incredible. Um, that was something that, you know, we always wanted to do when I was in Houston and, and didn't quite have that level of collaboration. So I think that's really great. Um, but as you can see, uh, new, new striping flex posts to narrow the roadway, speed cushions, which are a distinction from speed humps. Speed humps sort of go across the whole roadway. Cushions are like little pillows and they can be designed such that the fire truck or a bigger apparatus can actually go through those gaps without slowing down. Um, so it works for a lot of parties, uh, works to achieve slower speeds and uh, allow for emergency operations to proceed um, without much impediment. Oh, and uh, I will note, some preliminary data on the south side example here shows some reductions in speeds, I believe about five miles per hour. Um, and so we're seeing some, some data to suggest that these types of things work. And that's what we wanna really double down on when we're talking about a vision zero strategy. Another sort of building on that, this is a small example. So I will note this is does not include everything that we've done, like sidewalks or any policy changes um, or any like signal timing adjustments. This is really just some of what I was able to gather uh, that's been done through transportation teams. So in the last five years, uh, so this is since 2019, about 32 um, of those pedestrian signals that I showed in the previ previous example, there are 41 that are pending installation, 36 school flashers, so signals around school zones with six more on the way, six no right turn on red um, implementation, so right turn on red restrictions, four roundabouts with one in design, uh, five traffic circles like the one you see on the right here with six more on the way, curb extensions, curb ramps, um, redesigns, pavement marking updates, and more on the way, along with a set of um, speed hump and speed cushion projects, a first ever raised pedestrian crossing that is under construction on NCCU's campus with two more in design. A uh, little bit more about this, I'm working to get a lot of this data mapped, um, pairing it with some other data that I know this committee in particular has been asking for updates on where certain projects are at. Um, are they in the design phase? What, what are updates? So I, I recognize that has been an ask of this committee, um, and I think that's a very, very great ask. And so this is part of a step towards getting something together that shows um, sort of where we're at and where we're headed with project implementation. So we're doing great work. What are the needs? So since February, I've recognized two big needs. One of those is um, to benchmark. So what have we been able to implement um, 
in the last five years or so that aligns with Vision Zero, what is the Safe Streets project? And looking at what we've completed, what's under construction, what's in design, we need to know this so we have a good sense of timeframes, how long it takes to implement something, and how much we can implement every year so we can set realistic benchmarks, but also so we can know, well, why is it taking so long or how can we improve the process so it's quicker? Uh, we really have to know and learn from the, what we've been able to do to be, make those improvements. Also want to continue doing an analysis of the crash data. So I showed you some of that, but the next step would be a high injury network analysis uh, to look at those high injury corridors. We also want to update the Vision Zero resolution. So a note about this, this is, um, the purpose of this would be for two reasons. One is that um, right now we are not quite eligible for safe streets for all implementation funding. Let's say we had an action plan. Um, we would not be eligible for the funding because we don't have a date at which we will end traffic deaths. So our resolution says we commit to ending traffic deaths and serious injuries, but it does not have an end date. And that is a requirement for the Safe Streets for All implementation grant. We could get away with not having it. We we There's a certain set of requirements. I'll get to that in just a second, but it's an easy um it's an easy update to the resolution. And the second thing is that it's necessary. We want to create that sense of urgency. We know that we need to hold ourselves accountable. And so uh, establishing a date at which we'll end traffic deaths allows us to do that and set that benchmark. And then the other need is to convene. So I heard from a lot of people that, um, you know, we had to bring people together. Uh, people are anxious to be a part of developing the Vision Zero Action Plan. So um, since about February, I've been doing one-on-ones with staff in the city. Um, in the last week, I presented to the monthly directors meeting. And just this morning, I presented to the assistant directors meeting this same information that y'all are hearing. Um, just to bring everybody sort of uh, get everybody in the same page and reinvigorate this effort. Um, and so that will continue. And I plan to do that with our other partners, with the community, um, which leads me to talk a little bit about the Safe Streets for All federal grant. So to be eligible for implementation, the action plan has to meet um, these two components. We have to say yes to three, seven, and nine. And then we have to meet at least four of the other six to be eligible. So number one is the um, resolution date or the date at which we will end traffic deaths. That is, that's what number one means, leadership commitment. Has there been a commitment by a a leader and has there been an established date, a time frame, an end date at which you will end traffic deaths. Um, planning structure is, was there a committee to develop, monitor, and hold accountable the action plan? The safety analysis is one that is absolutely required. It's what I talked about just before. So that is underway um, and includes a lot of uh, steps, a lot of different ways to analyze the safety data, but that is an absolute necessity. Engagement and collaboration, equity considerations, I think our equitable um, blueprint will be really key here. Uh, and just that in and of itself, but also just the city of Durham's commitment to um, equitable outcomes, I think is uh, going to more than meet this criteria policy and process changes. So are we recognizing in the action plan major policies that need to be addressed or added? Um, strategy and project selection. So this is the second one that we have to have. This is really about like, have we identified priority corridors that we will address? So I think as we continue to develop the action plan and have data outcomes, it'll be really important for us to look at those um, 
what the high injury network is suggesting. We also want to look at what are we missing, right? The crash data doesn't tell us the full story. So we want to be sure we're integrating other uh, ways to look at risk and prioritizing those quarters as well. Progress and transparency this is really about like, will you have some sort of mechanism to um, make all of this publicly available? And then finally, the action plan date. This is, was it developed in the last five years? So I just wanted to run through that of what you can expect to be in the action plan. Um, the Safe Streets for All does not dictate how our action plan should be. It, it's a funding mechanism. It's a wonderful fun, funding mechanism. We don't know how much longer it's going to last. There is $1 billion on the table right now for this year alone. Uh, so, you know, we want to take advantage of that. So we want to be sure to meet this criteria. And anything we do beyond this, I think, is uh, really going to help shape Durham's specific action plan for future opportunities or for CIP or any other um, requests that we want to make to to prioritize uh, safer streets. So for the rest of the summer, um, from June to December, the plan is to re-establish some of the Vision Zero coordination groups that I think um, were started up in 2017, 2018. So kind of kick that off again. Um, and then as part of that, as we're continuing to do um, outreach and hear from folks and continue to work with uh, city departments and our partners. We're gonna develop a set of priorities and actions out of that. We all know there's a lot of existing engagement happening um, from the city side, from uh, our partners. There's a lot of plan updates like the bike walk plan. There is the reimagine Durham freeway effort that is gonna be kicking off. Uh, all of those are very aligned with Vision Zero, and they're going to be doing engagement. And so rather than duplicate efforts, <clears throat> the, the plan is to just kind of tack on to those existing uh, engagement opportunities. Um, so that we can assemble a Vision Zero action plan by the end of 2024. Um, so... Last slide before I end with a question. This is what I just talked about in a timeline format. So you can kind of see the breakdown of the thinking here. So starting in February, going through May, we'll be doing a lot of the project summary and evaluation along with crash analysis. So hoping to have some outcomes on those things heading into the summer, um, but we'll simultaneously be doing stakeholder engagement. Um, also hoping to have that Vision Zero Resolution update done in May. So we're hoping to go to city council sometime in April to a work session to present a lot of what I'm presenting here so that they're prepared and they're um, informed that we're gonna be asking for a resolution update. And then from about May to July, we'll be doing community engagement. Again, this is going to be existing uh, meetings, events. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you all know of um, events and, and neighborhood meetings that are happening that you think would be good to have Vision Zero presence, please let me know. I'd love to be able to, to really go to where people are and go to where events are already happening rather than create something new. Once um, the summertime hits, we start to compile a lot of those outcomes and have a first draft action plan by the, um, sometime in September. And then that would go out for a review in the fall to some key stakeholders, make some final edits, and then have a final action plan in December of this year. Um, one thing I will note that I didn't quite mention here is the MPO's effort to develop a regional safety action plan. Um, that will be happening when all of this is happening. So we are working very closely with them. Um, I was on the selection committee for identifying a consultant. Hopefully they will get the notice to proceed. 
this month so they can kick off soon. Their plan is to have a completed action plan by March of 2025. Um, so just know that, that all of that is happening as well. And the reason why we are creating an action plan separate from that is that we really want to be prepared for next year's uh, Safe Streets for All implementation opportunity. So that's why we're we're moving ahead with this. Okay, one last question. Started with a question, I'll end with a question. Um, so on the slide is a bar graph with starting with the year 1993, going through maybe, what, 2020? Um, any guesses on what this might represent? Mean number of fatalities in a specific city over time. Mm. No. No. But I like that guess. Any other guesses? This is the number of fatalities in passenger airlines, commercial in the U.S. Um, this is big. This is a big one because um, the airline industry is a huge, huge, massive conglomerate of different federal regulations and industries. And I think this, to me, says a lot about how committing to ending um, fatalities comes from a collaboration and a political will. So what happened with this was there was a series of uh, fatalities in the 90s going into the 2000s, and it took leaders of the industry, pilots, and uh, folks at the federal level to recognize this is unacceptable. Nobody should be dying in our in our airways we need to do something about this so they actually came up with voluntary safety countermeasures that were simple things like just doing a basic check of planes before uh to look at certain you know components of the plane and making a note of that and they reviewed every fatal incident that happened and they made improvements based off of what they found and as technology advanced, their recommendations advanced, and they all did this recognizing this is this is something that we can end, and it's a choice, and we commit to choosing that nobody dies um, in the in our airways. And so I think you know um, this can happen in our roadways, right? Like this is something that we can totally achieve. <clears throat> and improve street safety and it's really going to be political will and it's going to be partnership and it's going to be consistent and sustained um strategy right because it can go to zero and then we it, then something else may happen we have to continually recommit to this so i just wanted to show this example um and kind of uh let everybody know that that this is this is totally possible and i know y'all know this but uh, I just like to to remind everybody of that and and show different examples of how this can be achieved. That is all that I have. See the chat going off. I don't know if I have time for questions, but I'm yeah, happy to take some. We have okay. a little bit of time, yeah. And uh, I'm going to throw the first one to Andres. We don't have a lot in the queue, so Andres, if you just want to. Ask your question, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So Lauren, thank you so much for putting all of this together. Um, we've really been happy to have you uh, these last few months. One quick question that I put in the chat earlier. Um, I'm curious as to what tools the city has at their disposal to reduce speeds on streets like Alexandria has and whether that just applies to residential streets or uh, if that's the case with more major thoroughfares as well, 
or even state owned roads. Yeah, so the Alexandria example, as y'all probably know, um, they don't have any state owned roadways and they are 15 square miles. So Durham has 115 square miles and many state owned roadways. Um, that that doesn't mean that you know we can't get there too. I think um, from what I can gather, the tools that we have are the same as Alexandria, how they are applied are gonna be different, right? So I think some of our policy might need to shift around where we can do traffic calming. Um, and we need to be thinking about, you know, what what is the um, appetite for testing some things out on different types of roadways. So when we're thinking about our residential streets, we may be able to do a little bit more traffic calming or be willing to do a little bit more traffic calming. What might that look on <clears throat> um, some collector streets to try out um, traffic calming where the speed limits might be signed a little bit higher or the traffic volumes might be a little bit higher than what our thresholds currently are. So I, that's, um, that's my initial take. And I know that, you know, there's, um, some upcoming work to look at our traffic calming policy and kind of rethink what that looks like. So I'm, um, definitely think that's a really good opportunity to for us to think about how we'd want to see that shift to be able to be a little bit more effective citywide. Uh, this is Ed. Can I ask some kind of piggybacking on 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 that question with regard to um, changing the speed limits? If I recall correctly, several years ago, there was a, um, a move to reduce the speed limit on some streets in Durham, but it required legislative action in with the state legislature. Um, to, to what extent um, is all, you're, you're doing great work. This is a great presentation, but I'm, I'm wondering to what extent are, are you, you or others engaging with on the state level to get um, policies, laws in place that are gonna impact um, the goals of Vision Zero? And is there a coordination with, with other municipalities in the state? Um, in, in trying to persuade on the state level? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I <clears throat> haven't gotten to the state legislation yet. Perhaps there's somebody here that might know off the top of their head, but I will give an example um, from Houston, which might be, might be applicable here in North Carolina because uh, the state of Texas <clears throat> had a uh, legislative control over setting speed limits so municipalities could not um but there was the legislation was written such that you had to do an engineering study um and that's all it said was just uh, in order to change this you have to do an engineering study it was very vague and so the city of austin actually is a wonderful example of how they use that language and spent one year doing engineering studies, um, sort of mostly citywide, to look at speed limit changes both at the residential level and on their arterials. And they were able to decrease speeds on 80% of their urban core, including residential streets, which is huge. Like the, to be able to find this sort of little um, way to achieve that without having to change the state legislation. And so I'd be curious if North Carolina might have something like that in the language that we might be able to leverage. Um, so that that's on my to-do is to kind of dig into the state policy there. Thank you, Phil. Thanks. I want to keep us moving on time. So I'm going to go to Jeff's question, then Heidi's question, and then Aspen has a question about funding that dovetails with something I want to ask. So we'll do that last. I'll try to Thank you. roll well, those together. So Jeff. Excellent presentation. Thank you for being here. Um, quick question. What can we as BPAC do to help move Vision Zero forward? Oh, um, I would say off the bat, I would love um, some feedback on what the, what you would like to see the priorities for the action plan. And that's to say, in, in your 
in, in a world where, you know, we can um, hit the ground running like the first year, what would you want the city with limited resources, limited staff? Uh, what would you want us to see? Like, what are one or two things that you would want us to start on right away? Um, that to me is going to make a really informed and uh, actionable action plan is to know like here, here's where we really need to hone in on and as um, detailed as it can be would be great. Um, so if there's something that's been really a policy change or um, some street design standards that you think we really need to move on, I think those types of things would, would be really helpful to know and to push this out to, to other groups of like, we are actively collecting um, I'm actively wanting input on that and what those priorities are. So that way we can have a, a more informed conversation later on about um, what we're prioritizing. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Heidi had a couple of questions about the role of the county. Uh, what do you think the role of the county is in this? Also Durham Public Schools and specifically, should the uh, county commission pass the zero vision zero resolution? Ooh, yeah. Well, I am learning about this North Carolina special, as I've been told, with county <laughs> county, and um, not owning any roadways, but maybe trying to get some skin in the game with other resources. So um, I don't know if I can really speak to that other than I can give some examples from Houston, where the county commissioners uh, prioritized funding for uh, safe streets infrastructure in their precincts um even if they weren't their own roadways they would they were they were allocating their funds to city streets to make improvements in their precinct um so that's one example that i can think of of how the county plays a role in this and seems then, like that would, here that seems like it would be the city but yeah um yeah, I just really asked because I thought the county approves the transit plan where we decide how to spend the half cent sales tax for transit. And currently there are a lot of better bus improvements um, and other things built into the plan. I just wondered going forward, um, should this be a specific focus of the county commissioners? And if so, yeah, we should be probably included on your group of stakeholders and you know, you might even want to present to us. And if you want us to pass a resolution, I'd be happy to introduce one if if you would help me write one. Yeah, I'd love to follow up with you, Heidi, about that. Uh, at minimum, a presentation sounds great, but so I can just learn more about the the role there. That, that sounds... Yeah, yeah I great. think you're fantastic. I'm so excited <laughs> that the city hired you. This was a fabulous presentation. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, so <laughs> I'd be happy to talk more and also connect you with Ellen Beckman. If you haven't met her, our I met her. She's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she is. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Heidi. So Aspen had a, a couple of questions about funding, kind of both on, it sounds like you're gearing up for a Safe Streets implementation grant, but also wondering about local funding. I actually want to ask about the Safe Streets real quick before I get into that, which is, could you speak just a little more to the urgency of getting that update to the Vision Zero Resolution with yeah, respect yeah. to funding cycles? Oh, um, I think we wanted to, um, I'm looking up into my brain to remember what the conversation was about the timing of this. Um, I think we wanted to have, go to city council work session in April so that way they would approve it by May because um, having that in before the fiscal year ends seemed like um, the better timeline and time frame to get it done before then and maybe to get it done before city council kind of um, takes a rest in July. Yes. So I think that was the, the reasoning there. Um, and in general, just because then I think there's some other things, components of the resolution that we want to do, like um, update it from the five E's to safe systems. And that just sort of really sets the stage for us to have that that policy in place for a better action plan. 
So maybe even going to Jeff's question a little bit, if you were to say if BPAC wanted to write a letter in support of that resolution, you'd need that to come in April. Yeah, okay. I think so. And I can um, double check and get that answer to Hannah too, just to make sure. Right. Um, I'll, I'll probably be emailing you about that soon. <laughs> um, the, the rest of Aspen's question, and I think I'm gonna have to end the questions after this one, is are, are you, in addition to the Safe Street grants, would you be looking for other funding streams um, more locally? Um, seems like the city's always short on cash for implementation is what I realized. I'm sure this is probably a big part of your implementation plan and development, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the goal would be we get a good amount of money through Safe Streets for All that carries us through a next, you know, um, framework for a series of CIP asks, but also as we think about, you know, when we're um, making budget asks where this is all stemming from, that where we can't fill, where Safe Streets for All can't help us, like with maintenance or repaving, the things that it doesn't cover can, how does that inform the asks then um, to maintain a lot of this infrastructure, right? That's a big piece of vision zero. That's I think a lot of what we're facing now currently of just not having the resources to maintain. And that's only gonna become louder as we put more things, uh, different elements on the ground. So I think we need to be thinking about how we're framing that budget and local funding for maintenance of, of the infrastructure. Got so it. I'm not quite sure exactly what that looks like. <laughs> I'm new to the like funding, funding mechanism game locally. Um, so I'm learning along with y'all and many others about how we can make sure that we get this on the ground and it is well maintained. <clears> okay. <throat> hey, well, uh, just let me echo what others have said. That was a great presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, and you're always welcome here. Uh, you're going to hear from us a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for, yeah. Thanks for giving me the time. And um, I really mean it when I say I'm, I'm hoping to learn uh, from this group, what the priorities would be, you know, in that first year. So anyway, um, maybe, uh, you know, getting that information out and back to me somehow, I can workshop that with Hannah, but please keep that top of mind. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. We're only a little bit behind now, but I think that was a discussion worth having. So uh, we're going to move on to committee and liaison reports. We'll start with the committees. Uh, up first, we have Triple E, Ideal. And of course, that's when I can't find my unmute button. Um, Y'all, so at our last Triple E meeting, we talked mostly about two things. Um, one, uh, figuring out a little bit more about what we're going to do regarding this scorecard idea, um, in terms of how we're going to structure the workflow and what requests we will make of other folks on the commission, as well as, um, what the, you know, the timetable is for people reading a particular report and kind of getting feedback um, from those plans. So for instance, the bike walk implementation plan, um, reading it and seeing if you can identify any projects that were specifically proposed. Um, and we have a spreadsheet for everything, right? And so you'll get that shortly <laughs> so that you can tell me which one of these plans you want to sign up to read and skim through. Um, to identify projects that were proposed in that and to also dream up what kind of questions we think we should um, use universally for all of the different plans that we review. So just know that um, that will be coming to you here soon. Our hope being that um, if you pick a plan and you commit within the next month to reading your one plan and dumping those particular thoughts into the spreadsheet, our little collective crowdsourcing spreadsheet, then our committee can get back together and consider um, a universal approach to how we want to then score the plans and decide what each, what the city and county score um, on the respective plans that we read. Um, and then maybe there's going to be an overall score. So 
Um, that's one of the tasks at hand um, that we think would be really helpful to help us know whether we're making progress on our stated goals um, and strategies that have been named in these documents. We spend a lot of money to make these documents. And so um, it will be good to see whether or not they are being implemented. Um, the second thing we talked about was bike month. And so thinking about what kind of things we want to offer to the bike month um, festivities. And so I know that some of the ideas that were tossed around included um, doing, uh, let me make sure I'm wa watching here, um, doing a screening of a film uh, called Biking While Black. And so there's a few of us in the community. Um, I've attended the planning meeting for this on behalf of Triple E um, with um, some other folks in the community and other uh, Bike Durham advocates. And so it's looking like we're thinking May 22nd or May 29th. Um, and the director of the movie is available to do kind of like a, a meeting and talk about the film. Um, and there are some local panelists who are also local Black and cyclists themselves who would be willing to sort of round out the panel discussion about um, the content of the film. Uh, and so we have gotten pretty far in terms of location and ideas around that. The second idea um, was also possibly like to do a bike safety rodeo um, in one of these communities that um, Lauren just spoke to us about that is experiencing these um, fatalities or um, injuries, um, likely as a as a result of poor environment um, environmental design that uh, doesn't keep people safe. Um, but oftentimes, I'll be honest, like as an East Durham resident, I can't tell you how often I see these babies out here on these bikes with not a light, not a helmet, not a nothing. And I understand that it takes resources to properly equip um, your 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 bicycle. And a lot of people have never actually been taught certain things to keep them safer while they're out there. I know that that's lower on the um, pyramid. It's higher up on the pyramid, but it's lesser impact. Um, but it is something in the meantime, while we wait on the built environment to catch up with our safety needs. Um, Brian warned me that we may not have bandwidth enough to do both, that we may not have um, resources to do both. I know that BPAC has a little bit of money. I would love to be able to offer some of BPAC's money to the film screening and or the bike safety rodeo. Um, but I do agree with him that we got to pick one or the other and the bike and the, and the film screaming screening sounds a little bit more plausible with the idea that we might do the bike safety rodeo another time when we've got more of our community's bandwidth back to us and not a ton of events on a calendar to compete with, um, which is totally fine with me. Um, and then of course, uh, Andres offered a beautiful, um, update on social media and things that we want to do there to make sure that we're properly communicating uh, our strategies and introducing ourselves and doing a better job of highlighting opportunities for feedback, um, attending events, and um, knowing when our meetings are and sharing our priorities. Thank you. I, I will note we have a little discussion around what to do with our budget and the need for volunteers for new business. So I think we can circle back to those items too and hopefully come to a decision tonight on what we're going to support. So thank you for that. Um, let's see, I don't have it in front of me. I believe uh, Devrev usually goes next. Scott. Yes. Hello. Uh, the Development Review Committee. We reviewed uh, four plans this month, and just a quick summary of each one. One is called Davis Park West, and it's in RTP on uh, Davis Drive. It was 11 acres, uh, 482 units um, up to the buildings up to 145 feet high, so relatively high rise um, apartment units. Uh, they back up to another um, 
townhome or other apartment community already. So there's already some infrastructure surrounding them. But we asked for multi-use paths, 12 feet with a tree buffer. And we're also now asking for a dashed center line uh, painted with thermoplastic. So that's part of our uh, template now to ask for along with multi-use paths and raised crosswalks. Uh, next was a project called Tri Creek that Brian reviewed. It was 20 townhomes on a little under six acres. And it's on North Leesville Road off US 70 uh, in the general vicinity of Briar Creek, a little north of that. Um, they have a adjacent neighborhood that the access to these 20 townhomes will be from the other neighborhood, not directly from Leesville Road. Uh, this project, they had already committed a 10 foot multi-use path and so we asked them to expand that to 12 feet and leave right away for another plan development that's already in the early works on the north boundary. So that area is going through a lot of development uh, and some of these projects are you know, overlapping with each other. Next one, land and review a project called 2613 Carpenter Road. This is in Northeast Durham off I-85 North near Glen Elementary vicinity and they um, have 18 acres and working on 98 townhomes. Uh, they have a couple of other developments to the east of them. So another area that's being built out. Uh, the uh, developers already committed to or agreed to a 10 foot multi-use path. Um, there's also a greenway that's adjacent to this project and the developer agreed to have right of way to um, access to the greenway. Uh, so that one, the developers, maybe they heard us coming or something, but they're already um, doing some of the things we would ask for. Uh, the next one was uh, 302 Maureen Road. And this one is along Maureen Road where there's a city project already for um, sidewalk and bike lanes on Maureen Road that will cross right beside this project. It's only half an acre and the developer is going to put up six townhomes. So Basically, there's not much road frontage, but we asked for um, connection really to the project that is already being undertaken by the city. So those are the ones we recovered this month. We have four new ones already in the queue uh, for this coming month and probably we'll get some others. So they continue to be busy. Uh, a lot of townhomes and apartments being um, uh, put up and all these little tracts of land are being gobbled up. So, you know, a lot of development happening. That's it. Good. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, if we've already got four, I think we'll be busy this month. Um, uh, next up, hi, Mike. Yes, sir. I feel like a sprint trying to get through Scott's notes. <laughs> um, so we had um, Eric Vitale came in, transportation planner with the city of Durham, talked to us about the Woodcroft pro uh, Parkway project. In particular, we had some questions about design of some of the right turn lanes and lane width, which I think he he answered pretty well for us. Um, spent a lot of the time talking about that. We went through the UDO rewrite again, uh, Denise's letter. Um, I We decided to go ahead and send that off to the contractors so they could take a look at it. Haven't had feedback yet, but I'll pass that along with the group if we hear anything. Um, did invite them to come in and talk with us in a meeting with the full commission if they want to do that or you know make ourselves available so they had a public forum but we'll see if they answer um we did talk about the walk audit briefly and the the letters that brian put together i think that's coming up here in a little bit in one of the next sections so we'll go over that and then uh, also talked about the agency scorecard idea uh, we know we had a couple bike Durham reps, including David, came in. We chatted about that a little bit, and then I think Triple E picked that up in their meeting. And that was it. Great. Yep, that was a busy meeting. Uh, okay, let's uh, move on then to our liaison updates. First up, Durham City Council, Carl. Thank you, Brian. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just a couple things real quick. Um, I don't know how many of you are watching the budget retreats that took place um, sort of two weeks ago and then one about maybe four weeks ago. Um, 
So a couple of things from the second budget retreat. The first thing is the um, the city transportation department presented CIP requests for twenty four for twenty twenty five. The total about fourteen million dollars. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Scratch that. This is like budget requests for. Um, I'm sorry. It, it was CIP requests for twenty twenty five. Um, total of about fourteen million, and that included a ton of things. Let me pull the screen up if I can real quick. A ton of things. Um, that we care about here, uh, Durham Rail Trail, sidewalks, new sidewalks, bike corridors. Um, there's a but there's about maybe 14 different things here, um, including even Vision Zero safety initiatives. Actually, we were just talking about um, slowing down traffic, school zone speed reductions and trail crossing improvements. There's a lot of great stuff in there um, that I think folks here can get excited about. So that that's those are all proposed in the CIP for 2025. That's got to be approved by the city council but a lot of good projects in there that I think we can all be proud of. The second thing is that um, uh, Sean Egan from Transportation presented also um, a big, huge package of sidewalks, totaling maybe $111 million to kind of catch up for all the sidewalks that we've underbuilt over the years. So that's a big number, but that's potentially in a big bond issue that may be coming forward either this year or next year. So there's definitely like planning to do like a big bond including a lots of dollars for sidewalks around Durham. So that's another big, real positive one for the work we're doing. Um, the next thing is just, I don't know if any folks were there. I know a number of you actually were there last night at the city council hearing. Um, we got a lot of comments from residents about a whole range of things, but there were a couple of ones that attracted a lot of attention and some big themes. One of them was safe streets, including, um, you know, changing the, the one-way pairs, the Duke Gregs and Roxborough Mangum in a two way as long as, as well as other safe streets kind of stuff. So a lot of support for that, that I think made clear to the, to the council that there's broad based community support and really like eagerness for the stuff, not only to get done, but to get done faster. So that was great input at the meeting last night. The last thing I will say, and I, I, I've been talking to Scott about some of the, the, the great work you guys are doing in providing BPAC comments and all these redevelopment proposals. So I really appreciate all the comments y'all are sending in and I look forward to the ones you mentioned. I will say that last night, on a development that was at the corner of, or uh, rezoning at the corner of 98 and Sharon Road. Um, you know, the city council and the planning commission urged this developer to provide connection across Sharon Road from the de plan development to, to some commercial on the other side of the street. This is the area that would be zoned for a uh, mixed residential neighborhood. So the idea was how, how do we connect that development to the commercial across the street? The developer proffered to, to create like a, you know, a, a walkway across Sharon Road, but transportation said like, if you don't do the whole thing with sort of ADA compliant stuff, signals and so forth, it's, we, we don't want anything. So it was, it, so, and the developer said, look, we can't go that far. So it's something that the council noted that we, you know, we had a developer offering him in his halfway. We weren't able to do that. Our impact fees from the city that we collect cover transit, but can't be used, I guess, from what they told me for actual bike and pedestrian stuff, which is disappointing. So I think there's some work to do, whether it's the EVO or other kind of policy, so that we can actually um, provide a better partner for developers who want to do the right thing or offering stuff that we need to be able to sort of be able to meet them halfway. So that, that's one we were all wrestling with last night. That was, that was the, certainly the development got approved, but that was kind of a disappointment that we couldn't get better connectivity for um, for bikers and especially pedestrians in that development. So just something to note going forward. But again, Scott, your comments from your committee were the one, that's one that, that prompted us to ask for more of that from the developer, which we did. And so we've got to we got to get better on our end to make sure we can receive those proffers in a way that, that makes it all happen. So um, yeah, there's a lot to say, but I'll stop there. Uh, but thank you all for your input and all the stuff that gives us the sort of the ammunition to really to work hard on this stuff on the, on, at the council level. Okay, thanks. That's a great update. Um, yeah, I, I did see and actually a lot of us saw the list of requests from the transportation department. We were very happy with how many bike ped projects were in that list. So yeah, and you asked me, and it's virtually like this time is almost all bike ped stuff. There's I don't think there's any streets in there really. That's you know, that's so it's really focused on on bike ped stuff, which is great. Yeah. Can I right. just ask a quick question on on that project that Carl that you were just referring to with the Shannon Road crossing? I guess like so. Sharon, yeah. So where where was that left? Is it's just not going to happen? It won't, or... won't happen. Yeah, yeah. At least for now. I mean, the city could come back themselves. We could do it later. But in terms of the developer, you know, building that as part of his development, it's not going to happen. So it was disappointing for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, next up, County Board of Commissioners, Heidi. 
Yeah, um, you know, as you know, most of the work of BPAC is in the city's domain, but I always try to think, you know, what has come forward at a work session or what is about to come that you all would really like to know about. <clears throat> and uh, I will say that the Durham County Transit Plan Work Program, there's an annual work program that has to be approved by the Board of Commissioners and also Go Triangle. Um, the draft of this work plan was presented to us. I also think it had been released for public comment during the whole month of February. So maybe you all are already intimately familiar with it because you looked at it then and commented. But um, if not, I will put the link to the draft plan in the chat here in a minute. But I just wanted to let you know that was happening. So, you know, there's, there's the overall Durham County Transit Plan. That is the plan for how to spend the tax dollars that we collect, the sales tax dollars that we collect for transit. It's about 40 million a year. It's for local and regional transit. And then that, you know, work program, because that's multi-year, is broken down to an annual work program um, with the budget for what's going to happen this year. So, you know, of interest, one thing um, that was new uh, in this plan, the annual, well, in the work program was fair for free transit here in Durham. Um, part of which redirects some of the funding that was coming from the transit plan dollars for the youth pass just to fare free transit in general. And I think the rest of it would be paid for by the city council. I think it's in the, maybe one of the budget items that Carl and colleagues will be considering. Um, <clears throat> so there's that, and I'll put that in the link, like I said, it's actually very interesting. And then the only other thing I wanted to tell you that's related to bike, pedestrian, transportation sorts of things, is that the Durham County Transportation Department um, is exploring all kinds of opportunities to increase access to trails and greenways, both in the city, but also in our unincorporated communities throughout the county. And Ellen, under Ellen Beckman's leadership, we have applied for a Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods grant to conduct a planning study on the Durham to Roxborough Trail Corridor, which is one we've really been wanting to take some action on for a long time. I think even before I was a county commissioner, which was you know eight years ago, I think this has been in the books for a long time. And so we're really hoping to <clears throat> receive some planning money for this and start moving it forward. Great. I think it's about an 18 mile stretch of yeah. unused railway land. Yep. Okay, great. great I think that's about it. There's a budget hearing on May 28th. Um, anyway, I think that's about it. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, next up, we have uh, Duke University. Nathan, anything to report? I don't, unless David Bradway does, because I haven't heard anything from the consultants in a while. So if David has... And I would let, I would defer to him on that. But if he hasn't as well, then nothing. Yeah, I'll push on that and try to find out what I can. Um, last I saw was a draft of the uh, the doc from the consultants, uh, but I haven't seen the cost estimates nor um, anything that Duke has agreed to design or build. So I'll work on that. Okay. Other than that. Um... Our Urban Future is a student organization trying to get Duke to do better uh, ADA compliance and walkability and bikeability, and they have a petition that they're circulating around the university trying to get different people to sign to then give to university leadership. Um, that's it. Okay. Very good. Uh, North Carolina Central Royal, do you have anything to report? He's still here. I swear I saw him just a minute ago. I think he just dropped off a second ago. He might have had technical issues. Okay. If he just pops back go, yeah. Yeah, if he pops back on, we'll we'll circle back. Uh Dost, Jeff. Uh the last DOS meeting was there was our annual retreat, so nothing really to report. Okay. Uh, any other community updates? Which anybody is aware? And Heidi's got that link to the work program in the chat. 
So I should follow up on that. And okay, well, we'll we'll move on. Um, okay, this gets us to old business. We've got a couple items. Let me share my screen again. First one probably will go very quickly, which is just checking in on the presentation topics for upcoming meetings. Um, third page of your agenda has that. We're trying to keep it as a rolling list. Um, I don't think I revised it this last month. We also have at the bottom an actual schedule, including what we've heard. So as you can see, we're actually booked out for sure through May and have somebody lined up tentatively for June from DDI. We don't have a meeting in July. So actually we are good until August, uh, which is kind of neat, but I will just throw out as to give everybody a moment to just have a look at this. Um, are there any topics we want to maybe start prioritizing or surfacing for the August, September timeframe? Anybody want to really hear about any of this uh, NCDOT safety measures, bike walk plan implementation, coordination of efforts at the state level were kind of the ones we had prioritized in earlier discussions. Yeah, I don't know if, um, I think Brian left, uh, Brian Taylor. I, I feel like any of these would be good for August. I'm kind of thinking, you know, where will the city be in their bike walk plan? If there's like an opportunity for an update by then, that would be good. Or, you know, if Lauren has an update on what she just presented, because a bunch of stuff would have been completed by then. Um, but I, I think it would be good, especially in relation to what Lauren just presented, if we could get, um, I, I don't know if we need to like have a meeting specifically with NCDOT or just like something within CDOT, I feel like needs to be done in order for us to collaborate on, you know, meeting Vision Zero goals and making sure that we're on the same page and what are, like, what we need to be requiring in our roads for safety measures. Because um, I think there's a lot of disconnect and it's kind of hard to advocate for Vision Zero when majority of maybe not majority, but a significant number of our streets are owned by NCDOT. Um, and so we need to be, make sure that we're on the same page in accomplishing the Vision Zero goals. I, I agree. So yeah, that, that does sound like something we ought to follow up with. I'm wondering if we could hold that into the suggested NCDOT topic, or if we ought to reach out and with a more focused ask around Vision Zero. We have time to think about it. Right. Yeah, um, and maybe it needs to be something that's like outside of this monthly meeting, but okay. it could be like updated or not yet, yeah, provided an update um, in this meeting. I, I will editorialize a little bit. I'm not sure I am especially interested in too many slides coming from the NCDOT. I think I want more of the opportunity. <laughs> right for us to talk to them. Right, yeah. That's kind of why I was thinking it might be yeah. I don't know if that if we can do that in this type of meeting because normally we do presentations, but yeah, it would be good to discuss with NCGOT in general. I think I think to some extent we can do with our format of that time what we want, but it it might I you may be right, it might merit its own meeting. Um to that end, I'll just point out one more thing on the schedule. I kind of penciled something in for October to do something about next year's budget so we don't get caught flat-footed at the beginning of next year <laughs> on budget asks. So I'm just kind of blocking that out. Again, we don't have to figure out the details now. So um, let's maybe take that discussion offline a little bit and sort of think about what we want to have in terms of a safety-oriented presentation and or meeting this fall. Um, but Brian, on that one, I'll just say, I think the comments are right. I think I think to the extent that you can sort of focus that discussion as opposed yeah. to DOT just giving you like a bunch of like info, like like we need to focus that discussion about safety and let them know that that's what we want if we go that way. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we're I think we're in accord there of what we don't want from them. So, uh, okay, cool. Uh, I believe the next item. Oh, right. It's the letter. So let's see. 
Sweet. Here we go. So I, I had a soft goal to get two letters done this month. I got one of them done. So uh, as Mike mentioned in uh, the PI meeting, we looked at the letters. Um, so just to remind everybody, we voted on and approved the report of the walk audit and, and also the community outreach activities around the walk audit for the North Roxborough quarter that we worked on all of last year. Uh, we did that in January. Um, we decided to pull back on sending all of that out as one letter to our local electeds and to the NCDOT and are now parsing it out into some slightly more specific and focused tasks. Um, so this is the first of two, maybe three letters relating to the walk audit, at least two. This one is one where we basically bundled up everything we think could theoretically be done in the next two years to improve safety along that corridor. There is another letter in, in process where we make the case for a road diet on that corridor, which is a longer term project. There's still, there's a lot of uh, comments and inputs to collate on that. I didn't quite have the time to get that all together in time for this meeting, but that's definitely high on my list. Um, and I, it should certainly be ready by the next one. And I think kind of tactically, and maybe it kind of makes sense to not send all these out at once anyway. So, um, so this is the letter we have. Uh, a lot of it should look familiar. Um, I guess I should probably read through it real quickly just so that it goes into the record. Um, but a lot of this pulls straight out of the walk audit report. So it should look very familiar. Uh, dear council members, commissioners, and staff members, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission presents the following letter to the Durham City Council, the Durham County Board of Commissioners, the North Carolina Department of Transportation, and the Durham Transportation Department regarding improvements to North Roxborough Street, north of I-85. DPAC asks that all recipients respond to these recommendations and present a plan to realize the changes needed by the community along this corridor. Attached to this letter is a detailed write-up documenting the process undertaken by PPAC to come to these recommendations, that being the report we approved in January. Immediate term recommendations for North Roxborough Street, north of I-85. Over the last year, the BPAC has performed an assessment of the North Roxborough Street corridor north of I-85 through the following activities. One, a walk audit conducted in February of 2023 of Roxborough Street between Lavender Avenue and Bonaire Avenue. Two, a community visit in April of 2023. Three, community outreach survey collected between November and December of 2023. A detailed report of these activities is attached and posted on the BPAC website. Again, what we voted on. Through these efforts, uh, we have come to the conclusion that the portion of North Roxborough Street in the Bragtown neighborhood between I-85 and Old Oxford Road needs significant improvements to reduce car speeds and conflicts with pedestrian users of the corridor and to enhance safety for all users. Here we present recommendations that we believe can be completed within the next two years in order to immediately begin the process of making this community safer and more accessible for all users. Separately, we will present a recommendation for a road diet along this corridor that we believe is required to restore this corridor to the vibrant, people-centered, and people-serving place it was originally intended to be. The improvements BPAC is recommending over the coming two years are the following. One, implementation of leading pedestrian intervals at Lavender Avenue and Bonaire Avenue signals. Two, Implementation of full signals with leading pedestrian intervals and high visibility crosswalk markings at Maynard Avenue, as described in the February 2022 report, NCDOT Pedestrian Safety Quarters, North Roxborough Street, attached for reference. That was a consultant's report, I believe. Three, addition of reflective tape or flashing LEDs on all speed limit signs in and approaching this quarter. Four, addition of radar your speed flashers to all speed limit signs. Five, Enforcement of illegal parking along the sidewalks that obstructs pedestrian traffic. Six, addition of bump out signs for no right turn on red on all intersections along corridor. Seven, addition of benches and shelters to all bus stops in this corridor. Eight, increasing the sidewalk buffer where currently possible using existing curbs. Nine, working with business owners to better delineate pedestrian zones along the street, encourage addition of street trees, public benches, and or outdoor seating where possible. In October 2023, the Durham City Council and the County Board of Commissioners formally adopted Durham's long-term comprehensive plan. The recommendations set forth in this letter are consistent with many of the specific adopted policy statements, action items, and community goals set forth in the transportation section of the comprehensive plan. 
Transportation Policy 67 emphasizes prioritization of transportation investments in communities not prioritized in the past, such as Bragtown. BPAC strongly encourages a review of the long-term comprehensive plan transportation policies as the information and recommendations outlined in this letter are considered. This quarter has significant potential for pedestrian activity and economic vibrancy. After conducting our walk audit and hearing from the community directly, we believe these changes will enable an enormous shift in the quality of life for pedestrians, cyclists, transit users, and drivers in Durham. Sincerely, et cetera. Any comments? Knowing that we have talked about this a lot in committee meetings. I don't I want to rush this. You love it? Thank you. Um, if there are no comments or questions, could I get a motion to approve this? I move to approve this letter. Thank you, Mary Rose. I'll second that. Thank you, Andres. All in favor of signing it and sending it out? Aye. 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 <clears throat> All opposed? The motion carries. On to new business. Thank you all very much. We'll do it again next month. Uh, okay. Brian, it might be good to look at the chat and maybe um, talk some of the things out just to make sure that everyone's uh, aware of the conversations. And also just for the record. Sorry, we're in the chat. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry, I was busy reading. Uh, can, Hannah, can you point me to where in the chat you wanted to highlight? I guess mostly just talking through it, but it's fine. We're on a time crunch, so um, the stuff can just be added in the, the comments and the notes. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, okay, new business. Uh, right. Use of outstanding BPAC funds. And I have Hannah an ideal marked for this. Um, Hannah, mostly for you to tell us how much money we have. Yes, we have um, around $700. Um, and those need to be used by the end of um, um, the end of June. Um, and that can be used for uh, anything such as, you know, admin items or food or, um, you know, things related to the work. So um, we do have the three meetings in person uh, coming up. So next month is the first one. Um, you know, if you all did want to have any snacks or anything like that at some of those, um, some budget could go towards that. Um, and then also some other admin items um, you know, a tent or um, like a pop-up tent. We haven't really been doing many volunteer things so far, but that's something that um, BPAC does not have. Um, and yeah, so that's the budget. I think it'd be good to, yeah, talk through it and see how some of the money, deal you had mentioned some of the um, things that you were looking at. Um, but yeah, we all take it away. As I heard you talking, the only other idea besides the idea I've already pitched, um, you were mentioning something about bike valet and some of the components, mm -hmm. maybe not being in the best shape or something. I don't know where the materials yeah. for that. So maybe restocking the bike valet resources. That's a good film yeah. screening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the bike valet, honestly, I need to like just spend like a few hours and try to put together some of the equipment, but there's a lot of broken ones right now. Um, and so, so yeah, if that is something that you all are interested in, um, I think each rack costs hundred or 200. Um, so if, uh, if someone even wants to help me maybe put together some of these racks and stuff uh, to test out, that would be good. Because I know we have two working ones right now. Um, I think there's a total of eight, but several are broken. And I don't know if they're able to be fixed at all. So. 
I can help you set those up and to make that determination. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I'm hearing I we might need to spend some so money on not. the <laughs> I'm you're not volunteer because I would not be able to help you <laughs> figure that I've out. set them up before, so I know I know how to do it. So I'm hearing we might need to spend some money on the bike racks for the, the bike valet racks, but we don't know how much yet. Is that what I'm hearing? But it could be a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um it occurs to me. I maybe put these items out of order because the next item is volunteers for things. I maybe we should decide what we're doing. Because we need to decide what we're going to do if we're going to put money towards it. Um, and I know we talked about this at, at some length in Triple E and ideally you kind of we're now leaning towards doing only the film screening or you're on yeah, mute. it's further along and it's a more well-developed idea and has better legs on it um, right now. I haven't even started getting into the bike rodeo stuff. Um, okay. So I think it's because the movie screening thing just moved further faster. So, yeah. And as I recall from Triple E, we were thinking something on the order of 400 to 500 from BPAC. To support that and what about volunteers what would you need volunteer wise for that yeah we would need volunteers to do bike valet um we would also um those volunteers would need to do an orientation with hannah obviously for how to properly set them up and shut down the valet so that she gets a box back that's in good order and supplies back that are in good order um, and we would probably also need volunteers a week in advance, um, to get them so that they, you, you know, or whatever Hannah's schedule is to get them in advance and then bring them out to the event on the day of whichever date it lands on the 22nd or the 29th. It's leaning heavily towards the 22nd, but we're holding the 29th just in case. And it would be at, um, poof. A teen center out in Wellens Village. So that's the other thing. We wanted it to be easy to get to in a variety of modalities. So it's next to the Wellens Village bus stop. Great. There Anybody? are two other volunteer opportunities, but I'll wait for that. Um, Which don't really have much of a budget ask attached to them if I'm remembering. They don't. Um, one is volunteering for Earth Day. Yeah. And the other one is a healthy mile cleanup. Okay. Um, maybe I should throw it open to the group, particularly anybody who wasn't at Triple E when we discussed this. Does anybody have any questions about the Biking While Black film event? How long is the film? This is a great question. So there's two episodes. Each episode is about nine to 10 minutes long. So the thought for the event is that it's an hour and a half long, uh, running likely six to 7.30 so that people can then still go get dinner and we wouldn't have to do heavy hors d'oeuvres or food things. Um, so that's a budget consideration. Uh, so we're thinking a half hour for the film, a half hour for discussion with the um, director, half hour panel Q&A kind of thing. So lots of good dialogue. Yeah. Anyone else? Do we need to determine volunteers now or is it just like we're going to think about it? For, I, I guess for all of these send a um, little spreadsheet because I have a spreadsheet for everything where you can sign up for that as well as the Healthy Mile or the... Um, uh, 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 uh what's Earth the day. the other <laughs> the earth day thank you i don't know why words are hard anyway so what will we have at earth day a table or a tent or something i guess hannah you said we don't have a tent right so we just have a table with a well, tablecloth 
Well, different folks will be um, bringing their tents. So like I have a tent, Bike Durham has a tent. So we'll probably have two or three tents there. And what we'll need is people to help us with bike valet that day. So we would not be working a table then we would just be like manning the bike valet. Is that? We'd be sharing a table. We'd all be having a good time together sharing. With bike Durham or? You're working it, right? And then bike Durham has a tent that they're doing it as well. And so how my understanding is that the bike valet would just be like behind. Exactly. So exactly. you need help manning the bike valet, which is, yeah, BPAC's like bike valet. Mm -hmm. But I mean, BPAC has swag items and it has, you know, some of the printed things. So definitely should have that on the tables as well and telling people about BPAC and these vacancies and stuff. So exactly. Not just, just like we might need to update some of that swag though. You know, I worked at the Bike Durham um, event last fall. I guess uh, Nathan and I were in a, at a table and some of our stuff's kind of either depleted the good stuff or it, it just needs to be refreshed or something. I, I just remember not really having anything cool to give away. Yeah, that was something that um, Triple E before with Suzanne Schmoll, we had kind of talked through um, quite a bit of needing to update the one pagers and all that. And also, like, if you all did want to have like a graphic designer or something, like some of these funds could go towards that. And um... Do we have enough shirts that we could? Give out a couple of t-shirts. I mean, I know we can't give them to everybody that comes up to the booth, but. I mean, we don't have a ton of shirts. Uh, the thought was that those could stay for people who are volunteering. Um, but if you do want to give them away to people, I mean, you can um, have like the stickers and stuff. I would like, given the fact that the film screening is in a month and a half, <laughs> I, I do want to get a commitment for about how much uh, BPAC is willing to commit. So, you know, I know I have a lot of self-interest in this, so I will entertain a motion from someone else. <laughs> and also to clarify, um, so this film fest or film screening is in collaboration with a few other organizations, right? A deal. It was, is it bike Durham and We've already committed other resources. Yes. And then this money would pay for the screening itself. It would go towards the fee for the film and the director being uh, able to zoom in and talk to us. So if I'm keeping the tally right, if we put 500 towards the film screening, we'd have a little bit left to do maintenance replacement of the bike mm -hmm. ballet stuff. And that pretty much spins us out for 24 for fiscal 24, right? And then we'll get new money in July. Exactly. I mean, we need to spend wow. that money. I, to be clear, we're not, there's no rainy day here. We actually need to spend all the money. I move to allocate funds towards the bike screening. Do I need to specify how much? Probably. Yeah. I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I move to allocate $500 of BPAC's budget towards the uh, bike screening in May. Eight seconds. Okay, uh, we have a motion seconded to allocate $500 from the BPAC budget towards the screening of Biking While Black on either May 22nd or May 29th. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Probably need to add some time. Yeah, we'll get to that. All opposed? Motion carries. And motion to add five minutes to our time. Did you make it 10? A motion to add 10 minutes to our time. Seconded. Uh, all in favor of adding 10 minutes to our time? 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Motion carries. Ten more minutes. Maybe we will get it done in seven. I'd like um, to move. I'd like to move to spend the other two hundred dollars on um, bike racks for you know bike valet purposes. Just because if we don't commit it the money, then you know we're gonna we we need to commit all of it. So if yep. we've got some left, I'd like to go ahead and get a you know use for that and prove it. Understood. Agreed, Scott. I'll second that. Andre second Scott's motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Andre, so was that a late? That was a late aye. Okay, just making sure. Thank you. Zoom makes this fun. Okay, that motion also carries. Congratulations. We've uh, committed our budget for the year. We haven't spent it, but we've committed it. Uh, and I just lost my agenda. What do we have next? Oh. Do we have do we need to discuss any other volunteers or is that something we're going to send around offline? I'll send it around to the listserv. Okay. And people can uh, just add their names. I will address this last item very quickly um because it was mine and it actually doesn't need much time. Um we are on a list for the North Carolina or is it regional or statewide Vision Zero network Hannah that I get all those emails for statewide it's statewide so there's a statewide north carolina vision zero network that i sporadically get emails from a bunch of them went to my spam folder uh, which i think i fixed um anyway it's another group for us to engage with um and i'll be perfectly honest my time for doing vpac stuff is pretty much maxed out so i was wondering if anyone would be interested in taking on being the point of contact for that group for the durham vpac i'm not asking for volunteers now i just want to seed that idea that would be, I would add it to our list of liaisons that we'd probably ask for an update from each month. I think the meetings are quarterly and um, on Zoom, and then there's a bunch of emails about things as well. So I'd just be looking for somebody to maybe run point on that. So if anybody's interested in that or wants to know more, send me an email offline and we'll figure out how to you know you. when the meetings are that might help folks think like are they during like weekdays or evenings do you remember i don't off the top of my head yeah i don't either sorry i yeah. think i went to one for dennis and then i think it was during the work day yeah it's typically during the work day but yeah, they're that's... virtual so yeah that's the other problem i have is I, i'm definitely maxed out on stuff i can do during the work day so um I'll uh, I'll gather up some more coherent information and share it. If anybody's potentially interested, drop me an email and I'll loop you in on more. Um, okay. Are there any other announcements or updates? Okay, great. Um, as far as communication priorities coming out of this meeting, I have um, I'm going to contact reach out to Lauren specifically about the. Um, Sorry about the uh, update to the Vision Zero resolution and the language that she would need in a letter of support from us because I think we're going to need to draft that, vote on it, and send it out at the next meeting to help her out with that. Um, I'm happy to run point on that. Um, I think the PI committee took as an action to discuss Vision Zero priorities that we might want to put forward um, as a commission towards um, the development of that action plan. Um, I think. Sharing that soon is great. I don't think it's quite as urgent, but like it's good to start talking about it now um, so we can help out with that. Um, and Triple E Ideal is going to soon start pushing out the um, plans that we need reviewers for to start developing the scorecard idea. Is there anything I missed in terms of priorities coming out of here? Okay. We only needed to go a few minutes over. Um, reminder, next month, we are meeting at City Hall in person. We are meeting in City Hall in person. Are we going to be in the normal, like, where they do City Council meetings room, or what room are we going to be in? It is the second floor. It's room um, 2300. It's okay. the committee room floor, or the committee room. I've never been in there. Um but it's right beside the elevator, I guess. Um, and the doors will be open. 
uh, security will be there. So uh, anyone public and anyone can come in. Um, definitely want to make sure everyone's there at least 10 minutes early, though, because preferably probably 20 minutes early because people are going to want to talk and everything. Um, mm -hmm. room, yeah, catch up. Um, so, yeah, definitely come early. Hey, so plan for that next month. We'll certainly include reminders around that in the reminders for that meeting. But uh, I'm looking forward to that personally. It'll be good to see you all in person again in uh, a few short weeks. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Thanks. And thanks, Brian. One last thing, Brian, also too, the um, the sure. last budget hearing, just so everybody knows, the last uh, public hearing will be June 3rd. It's a couple months away, but just, I know we just had the last one yesterday, so the final one will be June 3rd. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Before seeing everybody next month. Great. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care.